Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Um, it's actually, it's, it's so cozy. <laughs> and if I look around the room, I think we have all the best people in Toronto that are here with us tonight. So thank you so much. It really means a lot to us and I'm sure to Shayla. So my name is Gaetan Verna and I'm the director of the power plant. So uh, thank you for joining us tonight for an artist talk with Shayla Keeley. And I had the pleasure of working with Chela on uh, a site-specific work that we created, or that she created, I should say. <laughs> I just gave her the huge canvas and said, go, Shayla, you can do this. Um, and it's part of um, the, for those of you who know the gallery, there's the clear story, which is uh, a large corridor in the history of the building. This, since the power plant was a coal-burning uh, power station, this large corridor was where where all the coal was being stored, which is why we have this beautiful, um, um, how do you say that? This beautiful space in which to, uh, we've created a clear story commissioning program in which we invite artists to create a site specific work, especially for this, uh, this space. So Sheila is really the first artist to whom we've asked to do this. And uh, as an independent project, a standalone um, exhibition. So tonight I'm really delighted that we would find time to have Sheila talk to us about her um, very important important career. So um, it is part of our fall exhibition and the show, the work will also be transformed within the scope of our winter exhibition. So I invite you to come back to see uh, how her work will progress and how the second wall will be invested by her ideas and her great work. So um, I want to thank our, uh, at the power plant, our primary education sponsor, which is CIBC for their generous ongoing support, as well as the Canada Council for the Arts, the Ontario Arts Council, the Tr Toronto Arts Council, and also BMO for their support of All Year All Free, allowing free access to all your audiences to our exhibition at the power plant. And I also want to thank our partners here at Harborfront Centres. So all lectures in this series, as well of uh, all of our program are free to members, so I really encourage you to become a member of the power plant. It's your way of supporting us, and it's also your way of having free access to all of the many uh, programs that we hold as part of our public program and education at the power plant. Now I will hand things over to my colleague Christine Bowen, who's our curator of education and public program, who will introduce this evening's speaker, Sheila Keeley. Thank you very much again for being with us. Welcome everyone. I want to reiterate Gaetan's thanks to you all who braved the storm to be with us tonight. It's nice to have you here. And um, it is my great pleasure tonight to introduce artist Shayla Keeley. Born in Oakville, Ontario, Keeley received her honors BFA from York University and now lives and works in Toronto after 24 years in New York City. For more than 35 years, Keeley has created wall drawing installations that are both site specific and temporary. Using a combined process of drawing, photography, and collage, her works express a long standing interest in both the intuitive gesture and a conceptual practice. Keeley has an extensive international exhibition history, having most recently created a commissioned wall drawing at Museum Attiberg in München Gladbach. Germany for the exhibition In Order to Join, which will soon travel to the Goethe Institute and the Prince of Wales Museum in Mumbai, India, and then on to New Delhi. Keeley has also had recent exhibitions at the Devi Art Foundation in India, the Ryerson Image, Image Center in Toronto, Nuit Blanche in Paris, France, the Vancouver Art Gallery, the Sao Young Village Public Art Project in Shanghai, and the National Gallery of Canada and Ottawa. Her work is represented in the collections of major international public institutions, including the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis, the Van Abbey Museum in Eindhoven, 
The Stadelijk Museum in Amsterdam, the National Gallery of Canada, the Getty Museum in Santa Monica, the Harvard Art Museum in Boston, and Museum Atteberg, among others. Recently, she was invited to conduct research at the Museum of Modern Art this past fall, which will result in a two-week performance in April. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome on this cold night to Shayla Keeley. Thanks everyone for coming and um, thanks Christine and also Gaetan for inviting me to do the talk and also to do these huge wall drawings here at the power plant. I've always loved those giant walls so it's a great honor and um, yeah and we'll have questions at the end. So um, I'm starting with a piece that uh, I did in London, Ontario in 1984. Uh, it's called Hotel Room 31, and um, this was a project um, initiated by Jamili Hassan and Ron Benner. So a lot of you might know about this hotel that um, had kind of, they're called SROs in New York, but it had people who would kind of live in the rooms for a night or maybe longer. And um, so I did this piece in the summer, and then I moved to New York that fall. And it meant a lot to me because it was a piece that would stay. Uh, the room was empty for six months and then um, people lived in the room as, as a hotel. And in fact, there was one gentleman, Brian, who got very attached to my room and lived in it. And he's immortalized in Martha Rosler's uh, through Dia, Dia Art Foundation in New York, did a wonderful book on social activism. And this piece is in the book, and there's an interview with Brian, who lived in the room. And um, so, yeah, it's a piece, it's quite a small room, and um, it was sort of a piece where you, you entered, and then on the left, there were these photos, and then you sort of gradually went around the room, and then you became kind of detained inside this room. And the photographs were all based on a um, well, gigantic trip I took over a year, 23,000 kilometers through Africa, overland in 1983. And in Algeria, I took these photographs of this old fort that was in the middle of the desert. And um, it was a fort that was used uh, by the French to detain uh, Algerians during the um, Algerian War of Independence. So it had a really terrible feeling emanating from the space. And um, the piece here in this, the room in that I did in the hotel room really was sort of looking at the fact that uh, Algeria is one of the first countries to attain independence, but in 1984, South Africa still was not free. So there was text all written on the walls from Franz Fanel's Wretched of the Earth, and text from my own diary that I wrote at the time. And um, you can sort of see on the wall, this was this weird kind of club room in this fort that the French army guys had sort of created a Moulin Rouge. And then there was this little niche alcove where there was sand that I put in, and you can sort of start to see that you sort of start to feel trapped in this room, and you're kind of in the interior looking out. And these were obviously the prisons and where they tortured people. And um, uh, yeah, and so oddly enough, Brian actually had his bed in this corner when I, it was empty, as I said, for six months. And then when I went back to give a lecture at the University of Western Ontario, I met Brian and Brian said he had peaceful dreams and he loved living in this room. So this was one of my, uh, I start with this piece because I feel that 30 years later it's quite a strong piece and it's all using wax and pigment and actually Vaseline and graphite powder and um, it was the first time I had integrated photographs w with my wall drawings and 
I was really curious with this whole notion that people think of the photograph as being real and a document of a real event, whereas drawing is not considered real. So that was sort of what I was um, interested in, kind of combining the two. And um, the piece stayed there, actually, for a long while. Recently, uh, the hotel burnt down, but the artist's projects stayed in the rooms for, what, I think at least 20 years or longer. And then on the door, there was just notes from the text and also the um, screenplay for the Battle of Algiers. I used text from that as well. And then the ceiling was completely covered, so it had this feeling of swirling sand because there was a feeling of the sand sort of cleansing or having this healing effect on the space. Um, then I, I moved to New York that fall, and um, I was invited by Exit Art. In, this was 1986 I did this piece. And Exit Art was a really important space in New York. This was their first gallery on Broadway. It was across from the old new, new museum. And they were doing shows, really, that no one else was doing in New York. And, giving people Adrian Piper a solo show, David Hammonds, et cetera. And this is long before David did his show at PS1. So Exit Art was inclusive and doing work that the museums were not doing in New York. And um, this was a show about illegal aliens, refugees. And there were it was a group show of eight artists. So I worked with one bay of... Um, the space, and this was a piece using photographs and really heavy wax and pigment. And my piece was about um, detention centers in New York City because I had done a project in Japan, and in that trip I had met refugees in or orbit, two Afghani men who approached me and we ended up talking for three hours, and I had to relay information to the Lawyers Committee for Human Rights. So. I started to get involved with them and also Human Rights Watch. So this piece was looking at notions of detention and what happens to people when they arrive in New York City uh, at JFK and then they're immediately put in prison, well, detention center, which is like a prison. And it was all, I didn't know anything about that. And of course, um, in the case of these two Muhajin gentlemen, they were put back on a plane, and then they were spending, I met them in Tokyo at the airport, but you know, they, no country would take them, so they were continually sort of flying from airport to airport. So, um, yeah, and then this is moving on to, uh, I was invited to do a project with the Mattress Factory in Pittsburgh, in 1990, and that was a huge honor for me because all of you, I think, know the Mattress Factory, but back then, you know, they invited you to do an installation, and it was sort of a dream for me. So uh, I was given two rooms to work with, and um, I did a piece that was sort of about kind of the theater of the body or the visceral these sort of notions of interior and exterior. And in this case, there were these X photos I had bought in Barcelona that were wax, and I heavily coated them with wax and pigment. And then they were lying on a, a steel table that was sort of at organ height. And then the walls were really heavily um, pigmented with thick, thick graphite powder and wax, so there was sort of the movement of my hand on the walls, so it was sort of this notion of sort of extending the body out into the architecture. And I think sort of this notion that you could see probably in the work even so far, this notion of sort of breakdown of the body within a room, but also um, these notions of interior and exterior. And then in the room next to it, um, it being Pittsburgh, to me that meant steel, so they asked me what I wanted to work with, and I said, old steel or steel. And they had steel sheets lying in the basement that a performance artist had used. And so they brought them up, and I said, don't clean them. And I created this sort of open anatomy book of um, kind of the inside of the body, and then there's also 
uh, bathtub-like form, sort of things that contain the body. And I wanted it reading sort of like a, you were entering an anatomical text. Um, I had been quite interested in notions of the body for, I think, from about 1985 on. Fragility, vulnerability of the body. Uh, through the AIDS crisis, and I'd lost my father when I was quite young, and just notions of really what makes up the inside of our body. Now it's much more common with the internet and um, all these uh, you know, uh, historic anatomical texts can be seen online, but back then you actually I had to go to the you know, natural history museums or anatomical museums in Italy, et cetera, and see, do my research. So, um, yeah, and it was really oil stick on the wax, but a lot of people who didn't know my work thought that it had sort of been etched or rusted into the steel. So I had a feeling that it was come, kind of coming out from the steel. And there were huge sheets. They were about four feet by eight. And there were kind of footprints. The guy who had worked with the sheets before had done a performance. And I was amazed by the memory of the steel because suddenly when the guy that helped me install, we put them up, there were all these lines in the steel. And we realized it was the memory of the um, sheets of steel on the floor, the wooden floor. And I've seen that with steel since, where I mean even the grease from your hands, it imprints as this sort of uh, you don't see it at the time, but afterwards it kind of embeds into the steel. Uh, this is a piece I did a few years after that. I was invited to work in an old um, silk factory in, near Arezzo in Italy. And um, it was a group show, and a lot of these artists in the show were sort of fighting over wanting these huge spaces. So I decided to work with this a small niche at the top of the staircase that um, would have had the Virgin Mary in it when it was a silk factory, and it was empty. And I had been doing research there on continuing with the Etruscans and sort of uh, looking at entrails and again the notions of the beginning of the ex photo. So um, I had, well, I'll just sort of go back, I had this heavily, heavily pigmented um, wax cascading down the whole ceiling, kind of way high up, down, right down to the staircase. So sort of going back to the roots of um, pre-Virgin cult in, uh, or pre-Christianity in uh, Italy, and through that research in the Etruscan sites. And then there was a small little off behind us as we look at this tiny niche area, I think it was an old bathroom closet. Behind you was this vast old silk factory. And that's where all the other artists were doing these huge things. And I chose again this small little um, closet almost with a tiny little window looking out. And I just encased it in all the wax and pigment. And then on the ground, I had more of those sort of ex-photo plaques kind of leaning against the wall. Uh, then this is a really large kind of mid-career <laughs> retrospective I was asked to do at Exit Art in their second space in New York, and it was amazing. It was a huge, huge space, very beautiful architecture, kind of a flat iron building. But I worked with the space in the back, but the space was 16,000 square feet, which was huge for me. Uh, so I did one whole wall of these drawings that I'd been working on um, called From a Secret Language, and each drawing is about 30 by well, 30 by 50 inches, they're, they're not small, and I covered the whole wall. There were almost 100 of them. And it was all about kind of that early research with the body that then moved into more the history of medicine and the imaging of the body. And uh, again, I wanted it to be um, sort of this sort of nonverbal, or I called it secret language, but almost like an anatomical text that you entered. And across from it, was the steel wall that I'd done at Mattress Factory relocated. 
And I wanted that wall of drawings to read stronger, and it actually did. So it's interesting with paper being, we think of it as vulnerable and um, sort of the soft medium, but the, the drawing wall was really strong and stronger than the steel wall. And then um, across from that was a whole kind of small installation of, I'd had been given a studio at PS1 uh, when I received my green card. And um, I worked on all this work called Notes on Healing, these sort of heavily uh, beeswax uh, plaques, again, almost ex photos, with photographs and things um, embedded into them. And then small objects and kind of unknown body parts. And so at that point I had this wonderful dealer called John Gibson, who had fallen in love with my work or, you know, was showing it and representing me. And so John said, well, you can't just have those sitting out on a table. People are going to steal them or they'll get destroyed. So he had represented Joseph Boys for years. So he lent the two boys cases. So we kind of enclosed the ex photos and beeswax organs inside the cases. And then there's an, an image of it, but I also had another table with a um, artist book that I'd done. I've, I'm not showing any images, but I, I think it's kind of really important. I've made artist books since 1984, but there's a real relationship between the books and then the really huge walls. Um, it's almost like you enter the book in your hands or you enter the wall physically in a space. Um, this is a project that I did um, in India. I was asked by Nature Mort Gallery, I'd known Peter Nagy in New York, and he had relocated to Delhi. So this is from 2004, and um, I was invited to come to a site-specific piece and do it on steel. So um, it was brand new steel, galvanized steel, which I had never worked on before. So um, even in these pictures, it's starting to rust, but uh, it was kind of challenging. So my mother had died of cancer um, a year before, so I had been really struggling with that. and. You know, when you try to help someone or heal someone and it's impossible, I um, was doing a lot of research and looking at plants and homeopathic medicine. And so in this piece, I um, worked just with oil stick on the steel. And there's a sort of lot of like sort of DNA. I mean, there's just a variety of things and a lot of um, plant-like forms. So again, it was pretty, this was quite intuitive, and I just treated it as a giant notebook. And I made the piece over three weeks in the garage, sort of off the side of the gallery. So a mongoose peed on it, so it started rusting kind of immediately. But um, then I ended, and I don't have pictures of that, but I ended up going to the steel factory where actually these sheets of steel were made, and I did a pretty amazing piece for the steel factory workers with their um, slogans, with text that they uh, had written. And then we kind of embedded it into the steel. So, um, and then this piece uh, kind of went into the basement or was put in storage in India. And then it ended up being shown here a few years ago in Oshawa. And the Robert McLaughlin Gallery bought it, which was wonderful. And the piece had done what I had hoped it would. It really rusted, and then the rusting of the piece kind of, you know, rusted into the drawing, but stayed away from the drawing. It's kind of hard to explain, but it was like a chance operation of the rust in dialogue with my drawing. So, uh, yeah, I was really happy about that. Then this is um, a piece that uh, I did a few years ago, I think t 2008, I was invited to China and I did the research for the piece and then the piece was actually produced in 2009 on site. 
And this was kind of an amazing project that Jonathan Watkins um, curated from Icon Gallery in Birmingham in England. And he invited three international artists to come to Shanghai and we worked with students from the university, but we were invited to this Saoyang village in um, Shanghai, which mainly the Shanghaiese didn't even know where this place was. And this is the model village that Mao gave to his first model workers in 1952. So those photographs I'd seen by you know magnum photographers or a lot of this historic material you'd see of people doing Tai Chi or, or these village shots, this was the area where um, Mao only allowed most foreigners to come to, and this, you know, was uh, where he, he got, allowed these peasants to have housing. And <coughs> it was a challenging project because the politics of it and just thinking, wow. So I came and I, you know, we met, uh, we went to the space and I decided really quickly not to work with the housing because uh, all those years later, <laughs> this housing was really pretty bad. So there were four apartments sharing one bathroom, one kitchen, and the workers were really upset, but there was nowhere for them to go So because of real estate values. So, I decided to ignore all of, you know, leave that alone, and I chose to work in the park because when we went into this park, I noticed people were hanging out in the park and playing cards, and so I chose to sort of do an intervention. It took me quite a long while to figure out conceptually what I wanted to do, um, and I decided to fill the cracks in, it kind of was like a tea garden where they would meet, with gold, referring to um, the Japanese and Chinese tradition with the ceramics when they're broken or they want to repair them, where they fill them with gold, and also sort of touching also upon that being elitist and knowing that during the Cultural Revolution so much of the ceramics, et cetera, was destroyed. And um, the student I worked with was brilliant. She's at Harvard now uh, doing a PhD on a scholarship. But Bing and I spent a lot of time talking and visiting the museum. And so um, it was a project that I think was very successful. It was really quiet, especially in comparison with the other two artists. But, you know, we had to go to the communist um, office in the center of the village and we met with the elders. I mean, these model workers were obviously in their 70s and 80s now. And we were given permission and um, Marx, Lenin, Mao's portraits were on the wall and it was it was fascinating, very strange experience, but basically I came back the following year and I was there I think over a three week period to do this piece and the students helped me. And it was also, I you know, couldn't speak um, Mandarin, but Bing spoke with the, you know, the workers. They were hanging out and it was pretty interesting <laughs> conversations and then I made a book, which was quite important. It was kind of hard to do, um, but I did it. And then I gave all the workers and the people kind of involved in the piece the book. And that, I didn't really think about it, but it was very meaningful to them because one of the gentlemen started to cry and then Bing's explained to me that, you know, Mao gave them the housing, but he never, uh, they were illiterate and basically they couldn't read or write. So the idea of them being in this book, you know what I mean, meant a lot to them. And so the project ended up, the Communist Party loved it, or I mean, ended up being very successful, but it was off the radar. And one of the people involved sort of hated the project because she really hated this building. <laughs> and, uh, I kind of loved it. So you could see where all these stains and there were those lines lower down were where the backs of their chairs kept whacking onto the wall. And yeah, so we just, we spent the three weeks quietly filling in with gold paint all these sort of stains and uh, memories of the walls. 
So this piece is called Workers' Pavilion. And I'm really happy the National Gallery is acquiring 10 of these photographs. Or they really love this project, so it's really nice that it will, you know, those images will st stay together. Um, then this is a project actually I did in Toronto. It was only there for a couple of days, but it was a really nice project um, done at Shaw Street School where um, artists that were teaching were asked to come and work in some of the old classrooms. So I did this piece um, kind of about, I was teaching drawing at U of T for five years, and I did a piece about teaching drawing and notes on drawing, and so everything was sort of notebook size. And I kind of left the chair and the table there, and people could kind of come up close and read the notes and uh, kind of enter this small notebook about teaching. And I had kind of my heroes and, you know, from bell hooks to whoever, people who had inspired me and notions of, you know, critical approaches to drawing or critical thinking in relation to drawing. Because I'd chosen not to teach full time, I'd been given a position at Emily Carr when I was about 32, a tenure position, and I said no, and I moved back to New York. So it's, it was interesting. Um, teaching drawing, sort of, you know, part-time, but uh, over that period. So, uh, yeah, and it only was there a few, I think a, a weekend, and then everything was taken down, and it's um, become, I don't know, condos or studios now. Uh, this is a large um, museum piece I did in northern Holland. I've shown in Holland for 20 years, but usually in Amsterdam, Eindhoven, Rotterdam, so that part of Holland. So it was really interesting. I, this was a place called Diepenheim, and it wasn't too far from the German border. And um, they have kind of a drawing institute museum. So I had shown some of these drawings at MOCA here in Toronto. And um, it's called From an, Ency an Encyclopedia of Slowness. Um, and it's really about drawing and notions of slowness. I guess um, in the era we live in, thinking a lot about slowing down to draw and why do I draw? And <laughs> you know, partially from teaching too, getting the students to kind of slow down. So these were pretty simple drawings. They were all uh, oil stick on um, gray uh, Strathmore paper. And again, it sort of harkens back, I think, to those drawings, earlier drawings I did in New York with the kind of notion of language and the language of drawing. And this wall was really huge. It was about 15 feet high, so nowhere near the size of the wall here, but, um, and about, I don't know, it was about probably 25 feet long. And then part of the project was, I showed the drawings in the museum, but then they had this really small, um, kind of like a garage, but it was called uh, the Autohus, and it actually is one of those structures where they're explaining at one time the animals would have been on the ground floor and then the people lived above to keep warm. And so it had beautiful old walls, and so I did a site-specific uh, wall drawing on the walls over, I think, about a three-week period. And you can sort of see this came out of the drawings from Shaw Street. It was done that summer. And so there's small little drawings collaged to the wall. And then I worked with India ink, oil stick, gouache. And when I do my wall drawings, I mean, they're made, I really think about the ideas behind them and do a lot of research. But when I actually do the work, I do it really in that moment in space and time. Uh, and the drawings often refer to another moment in time that I kind of bring into this new space. So this piece was a lot about poetry. It was quite quiet. I was 
rereading Anne Carson, Eros, The Bittersweet, um, thinking about, yeah, Eros Thantos. And so there's actually writing on the wall, uh, some of her text and also my, my writing, which I don't always do on the walls, but sometimes. And there are really large charcoal drawings of these sort of web-like, almost spider webs. So I was thinking about thread, textiles, and also that amazing quote of Mallarmé about sort of spider webs and writing. And yeah, just sort of wanting, you know, people just came in and sort of physically were involved. This piece, I didn't use ladders. It really just was about the height of my arm going up and kind of defining my body in that space. But the wall length was about, about 80 feet. I mean, it was long, so it was sort of, you know, the three walls. And it was there, I think, for a couple of months, and then it was covered over, which they didn't want to do. <laughs> they phoned me, and yeah, so a lot of work for years has sort of been um, covered over. And um, this is a project because Lynn, the dancer I work with, and I've worked with her over a 30-year period, Lynn did a performance here with my wall over two days. And I wanted to show sort of an earlier um, project that we've been working on since I moved back. I moved back here from New York in 2006. And Lynn and I had met in Antwerp a year or two before, and we started working together on this notion of a performing book, it's called. and. Um, this is one segment in, that we did together in, uh, at Western Front. So Western Front invited me to come for a month to sort of just be an artist in resident. And Lynn was working with Edem next door um, doing choreography and dance. So we kind of collaborated together and a lot of these small drawings on the wall are drawings from the project in Antwerp, the project in Montreal, Cyprus, and then Vancouver. And so it was just this suitcase where all these drawings were stacked up and writing. And um, again, kind of like a large notebook that you entered. So she did a couple of sort of, she works mainly with improvisation, so she did a couple of small evenings where she just worked with the drawings on the wall. And we've also made two books together too. The recent one, I mean, they're really my artist books, but they involve um, some of our ideas and her writing. And the recent book is called Notes on Choreography and Drawing. I, I was a dancer when I was young with the National Ballet School for about eight years. And um, yeah, I find the collab, I've worked collaboratively a lot in the past. Stephen Andrews and I worked together, um, you know, and Lynn and I, I just find it really interesting when you collaborate and you can't do it with everyone. And I think just the notion of the body and her notions of extending out into space are really exciting. So yeah, we're doing this project at MoMA together, which we did a small improvisation already, and it worked really well. So we'll be performing that formally in April over two weeks. Um, this is a recent piece that I was invited to do. I actually did it a year ago in Germany. Um, at the museum at Tiberg, and it was for this fabulous show called In Order to Join. And they, I was the only artist they commissioned a piece from, so I had to go there in, um, in the summer and see the space, because it's a very unusual uh, building designed by Hans Hohlein, the Austrian architect, who sadly died a few months ago. 
So I had to go to kind of see this space, and then the director, Susanna Tietz, chose sort of a very specific area that we can see now here, where she wanted me to work, because she loved the early work I'd done in these sort of cave-like or intimate spaces. So she asked me to work with the outer walls, but then work with the strange kind of inner um, space, and there was a tiny room too, so I'll just take you through it. Um, so this was a piece, kind of the beginning of it, by the staircase, and this was sort of text about books, and pavilion of books, and sort of talking, there's actually notebooks that you, I've opened up, so it's sort of my love of books and making books. Then you can see these weird staircases, it was almost like a little Greek theater, it was strange. You could sit on those little marble steps. And the wall, the wall curved, oh, and the important thing I didn't mention is we talked a lot about kind of why I hadn't done a lot of wall drawings recently or this notion of the drawings disappearing. So Suzanne said, well, that's not going to happen. So she devised with her conservators this amazing um, technique of covering all the walls with paper in a manner that it's seamless, it looked, no one really even knew there was wa paper on the walls, but then at the end of the show you could remove it. So uh, these walls are all covered with paper. And this piece is called um, German Notes, but after Lucretius, Deririum Natura, because from that time a few summers ago, uh, when I was in Cyprus, I, my work's really inspired by poetry, it always has been. I pulled out kind of various editions I had of the nature of things by Lucretius, and I was just blown away by how avant-garde, I mean, what a genius he was, discussing film, the notion of a film, and countless other things. And so I kind of dedicated, or I made this piece about my kind of free reading of Lucretius. So there's a lot of collage elements on the wall and uh, heavy oil stick. And then there was a space going down, the staircase that I worked with, sort of integrated into the piece. You can see it. And I did a piece, sort of not nude descending the staircase, but this notion of um, just, you know, walking down the staircase but working with drawing and with um, uh, a crayon. So it kind of recorded my movement as I went down the stairs. So it's on both sides of the wall and then going back up. So that kind of became part of the piece. And then there was a small little alcove room. And this piece the museum kept. But this piece was kind of a precursor to what I've done here. Um, while I was there in the summer, we there was an amazing textile show in the museum, and we all went to see this um, textile depot, they called it, but this sort of uh, dumping ground for all the textile equipment that the whole area used to be involved with, which is no longer, um, no longer exists. So it was like time stood still and all this machinery was there and looms full of, um, you know, threads, things halfway through production. And it really stayed with me and I took about maybe 50 photos, but I didn't really know that I'd work with that. But I found this quote I had of Mc from Marshall McLuhan about note, a note on obsolescence. And I just was thinking again, like that notion of slowness. Well, what does something being obsolete mean? And sort of looking at that factory and um, deciding that I wanted to work with it. So I used, because it was about Muchen Gladbach, which is where I did this wall drain, I wanted to kind of do this small room for the textile workers, or you know, just the, the site I was in. And um, the wall was all smeared with charcoal and pigment. And then on the walls were um, small prints, just from my home printer, of the factory uh, in various states of, you know, decay, different areas of it. And so there was sort of this notion of the hand, too, and thinking about 
all those years, I just like almost three centuries, they've been weaving and working with jacquard weaving in these factories. Then this was sort of come out from the little room, and then there was this very long wall um, in the main space of the lobby of the museum. And uh, I worked with a kind of overlaying of drawing on the paper on the wall, and then different layers of mylar drawings, notebook drawings. And when you, as you move through the space, they'd move. So uh, I worked with these kids when I was there. So they were running around in the space, but it was sort of nice the way the drawings would lift off from the wall. And there was a sense of layering. And again, kind of referring to the poetry of Lucretius. And then this brings us to the piece I did here for um, Gaetan. And so when, I think when actually we first spoke, and um, she had asked me that summer to do a wall, that's when I started thinking about the textile factory. And uh, it's, I mean, I seem to have done all these works over the years with workers and factories. And I think it's, you know, we had, ta had conversations about outsourcing and, you know, cheap clothing, et cetera, et cetera. But really, um, I'm interested in it. My background early on was in African studies and anthropology, and I was really thinking a lot about textiles as um, weaving, as early form. Of course, language comes from weaving, and music as well. And sort of thinking about Again, nonverbal communication or, or weaving, and then through the jacquard weaving and the um, early beginnings of the computer and computer cards. So, jacquard weaving was what they did do in this factory for centuries. So, you can sort of see on the wall there's a strange image of um, kind of like an x ray of some of the wool. And um, that typewriter like thing is. That's punching out the cards for the um, for the jacquard, and so I think all of you know the wall here at the power plant. But it's 25 and a half feet high, so I've never worked so high in my whole life, and it's 40 feet wide, like long. So, um, and the artists who had used it before had worked with text, so it was really interesting to think about drawing and kind of defining your body in that space. It was really kind of daunting and uh, wondering about it falling on you because the text pieces really kind of aggressively felt like they were falling on you. So I didn't know if it would work or not, but I really wanted to try to maintain a type of intimacy, so which is hard with such a huge wall, but to kind of bring the scale down so that you felt like you entered the wall and you had an engagement in the kind of analog digital or the feeling of the space, but also the feeling of the workers and their hands making, you know, um, working with these looms, which in the beginning, of course, were not speedy at all. So, um, and then there's an aspect that's a little hard to see here, but my home, I'm, so I, I came back that summer and I was printing out small prints on my little Epson at home, which isn't fancy, kind of for my own notebook or to conceptually work out what I would do. And the, um, my computer kind of, or I mean my printer went crazy for kind of one night only. And it did these crazy things, like you can see now. It, it, all this bright color, I don't usually work a lot with color. Some of the things today, tonight I've shown have involved color, but often I work just with black and white. So hot pinks, mauve, so there was no, um, there was no digital uh, Photoshop of any kind. Uh, everything that's here was in the actual uh, prints that came out of my Epson. So, um, yeah, they kind of wove. What's so interesting is it's like a complete circle of jacquard weaving, 
or you know the roots of the computer out through my digital and my home computer you know weaving back into the image and, and you can actually see it when you see the piece they wove back into it and chose to go over certain things and not go over others so like the rest of the steel I'm kind of interested in chance operation and kind of slightly going with the flow. So there in the center, you can see the actual factory up um, on the top there. It's, it's really huge, and that's just one of the factories. So it's also politically huge. This whole industry is gone. So first you had the steel, then coal in this part of Germany, and now the textile industry has disappeared completely and obviously gone to China. Bangladesh, uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, you know, it's outsourced and gone. So there's a huge problem with unemployment and no jobs for the, these workers. So you can sort of see the scale. I had to use um, a skyjack for the first time, which was amazing. So. Now I can do wall drawings <laughs> forever. Uh, it was really great, and I worked a lot with defining my marks moving with the skyjack. So it kind of opened up a whole new area with the wall drawings. And I think that's kind of it. So <laughs> if anyone has any questions, that would be great. Hi, Paul. <laughs> so I'm just thinking, um, given the uh, repurposing of the power plant as a, a space for exhibiting contemporary art and how charged it must have been for you to work in that to, you know, um, understand its original function in the building. Yeah, that's, that's really true because I didn't show tonight, but I did do a huge piece in 1988 in Japan in what was Sagacho was called, but it was a space where all the rice would come from the countryside into Tokyo every day, really early in the morning, and then all that rice would be, you know, sectioned off, bought to be spilled out all over, you know, disseminated all over Tokyo. And I could really feel that in the space. And um, yeah, one of the um, young people at Power Plant explained to me about the coal, and I never knew that. But when I looked up, I realized there were these huge steel kind of grommet from the beams, and I realized that's what pulled, must have pulled in the buckets with the coal right off the ships or in front, right in. Uh, yeah, it was nice to, to know that. Um, I don't know if it if affected me maybe psychically, but um, yeah, it I think is. I might have been getting at that. Whether there was any little <laughs> um, yeah, because motion there. It was interesting when I was in Muchen Gladbach because when I draw, I did some teaching at the Düsseldorf Art Academy, and uh, Rita McBride and I became quite close. But when I go into Düsseldorf, you could see the giant mounds of the coal just sitting there because they've left it. And that was kind of fascinating to me. And um, so, yeah, that coal industrial aspect of that part of, um, of Germany. And also because I'm going to be showing in January a whole series I did in 1986, photographs from the <clears throat> Mies van der Rohe, the Barcelona Pavilion, that was reconstructed in 86, which is, I photographed it before it was open to the public. But what I found out when I went to uh, Krefeld, just near Muchengladbach, to photograph the, the two houses there, that industry, that was silk industry, but fabric again, it was only 20, 20 minutes away from Muchengladbach, that actually is what funded the Barcelona Pavilion when it was initially shown in Spain. So the wealth of the um, silk industry. So yeah, it's, I guess, maybe the world has always been like this with things ending and new things occurring. But um, yeah, I don't know if there's pictures of all that coal, but yeah, I didn't realize that those walls never were moved or changed. So it's really interesting that history. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. 
Uh, I'd like to ask about the ex votos that you mentioned. Do you seem to have quite a number of references to them? I wasn't really quite sure what makes up an ex voto. I mean, are there some of them that looked like little plaques? Is that one kind? But then the others that looked like they were actual objects that would be what? Pieces of bodies or something like that. Can you? And and they're all wax. So can you tell me a little more about that? Sure. I mean, maybe some people here even know more than I do. But when I did the research, I realized the ex photo, obviously from Latin, comes a lot from the Etruscans, and so there was this way of foretelling, um, throwing the organs of um, animals onto the ground and then someone would kind of read into that and because I was visiting the Etruscan sites because they were not so far from where I was in Italy we'd looked at a lot of these things and I was reading about it so um, that kind of from what I think it then became par partially like the ones that you were that I used at Mattress Factory are wax ex photos that I bought in Barcelona that well, when you say you, you bought them, what were they? They're actually um, image like I mean I know what wax images of hearts, lungs, a penis, fingers. I mean, okay, you so name the, it. Their purpose would be to stand in as like this is my heart. Yeah, um, and then to lay, put it in the church and then make uh, prayers. And, you know, to, to devotional things to heal. So they, I had first seen them in Spain, but I mean, they're, it's like a bit like what's in Mexico too now, this, the silver ones that you see. Um, I was just kind of really interested obviously with the body work, but then when I looked more into the Etruscan, I was just really interested in the notions of uh, the interior of the body and this idea of um, reading those, you know, entrails that were thrown on the ground and then were read, that kind of notion of animism, and then also moving into like Christianity or what was used sort of through with the Catholic Church, because a friend had brought them to me initially from Barcelona uh, to New York, but then when I was there, and when was that '92, I bought them. I mean, there were just shops near churches. I don't know, I'm sure you can still get them. But I altered them with heavily with the wax and the pigment when I had the studio at PS1. So, um, yeah. So are the square plaque things, are they related or am I misconstruing? No, those, so those kind of came after that and they were, um, they involve photographs and uh, images and things kind of from my notebooks embedded onto these little wooden plaques that then I coated heavily with beeswax and pigment. And I used to have, I mean, I don't have any left now. They've sold or gone, but I had a whole lot of them and I showed them years ago at Coston and Clintworth Gallery here on steel shelves. And then um, they were shown, John Gibson showed a lot of them. But um, yeah, they were quite fragile because of the beeswax and the pigment. So they were more almost like a retablo or you know you're right they were pla they were like wooden boards that I coated and then they just leaned against the wall. But it was I think coming out of all that early work gestures of the body gestures of the sight. I mean I didn't show the huge wall drawing I did at the at presentation house either. When was that in 86? '86. but it was coming out of that visceral kind of body work. Yeah. Uh-huh. Just following on that, I was curious if you had uh, consciously drawn the relationship between beeswax and, uh, and Joseph Boyce before John Gibson had given you those cases to exhibit <laughs> them in. Um, definitely. I mean, when I was young at school, I was really interested in Joseph Boys and also Cy Twombly and kind of Louise Bourgeois. I liked her drawings, but um, no, he's, yeah, and I still often look at his drawings. And um, that sense of viscerality, uh, I think I was always really interested in um, kind of notions of dryness and wetness. And 
Um, you can sort of see the early installations. I mean, it's sort of hard to think, but I'm not kidding you. People were like weird about some of that early work. And the, the wax and the pigment, they were, they kept thinking it was blood. I mean, some, it's, it seems strange now, but when I did the work, even in 1986 at Presentation House, I smeared all the walls and I had these photographs, so then it became this, I mean, I was friends with Jeff and Ian and Rodney, et cetera, but it was like, oh, she's like smearing wax and pigment over photographs. It's like a comment on, you know, conceptual photography in Vancouver. I mean, it had, it was no comment on Vancouver. I didn't really know Vancouver. I'd just come to be an artist in residence there. But it was more, I was, I used to cover photographs with Vaseline. I was just really interested in this sort of, um, I think it came from the early work about the interior of the body kind of going out onto the walls and um, kind of those notions of uh, psychological or just sort of what is you and what is a room and maybe just sort of because I had worked on walls for so long thinking a lot about um, being in a room and your relationship with the wall and um, I think that's what's so interesting about um, I'm so happy get to ask me to work with the wall here I don't know if I could have done that when I was in my 20s. I mean, it was really quite daunting. But it, that, like when you look at the white wall that isn't worked on, just that notion of your kind of vulnerability with this huge, giant structure of architecture or a wall, or what's a wall mean? And um, yeah, and when I was younger, I was really interested in Gaston Bachelard, the poetics of space. And I mean, I didn't talk a lot about that, but Marguerite Dura, I mean, different things, but also the poetry of Pasolini. I mean, I was really inspired by Pasolini from the late 70s on when I first read his poetry. And um, so, yeah, I guess cinema, uh, reading, but a lot of film and architecture, really, I think, from the very beginning. So, um, did that answer it, Ben? <laughs> but I must say, I was shy when John said, you have to use these cases. I was like, oh my god. <laughs> so yeah, the boys got taken out of the case for a few months. Hi, Shale. Hi. <laughs> um, so forgive me, I'm sorry I was a few minutes late, so if you were talking about this right at the beginning, I apologize. But I was thinking about um, textiles and um, their connection to uh, vessels in your work and um, about how you, you mentioned a couple times about uh, defining your body in the space and about how, you know, w we often use textiles now like to define our, our bodies, right, when we're out. So I was just wondering if those kinds of relationships, um, tap tapestries as a more uh, fluid type of vessel, if those kinds of ideas, like what you were, if you thought about those kinds of things. Yeah, I think the whole, um, what's well, a whole, like, you know, it's so great being an artist because you're just eternally learning, you know, it's phenomenal. But yeah, textiles are, uh, I don't know tons about them, even weaving, all those, you know, it's just doing the research for this piece. Yeah, that is a language. I guess in the link to drawing being a language. And um, maybe even not wanting that being very literal, just the sort of mystery of that and trying to eternally kind of conveys something with a drawing then the simplicity of that but then the deeper complexity so um, sorry I don't know if I answered that too well no no thanks I was just honestly I was I was thinking about those things and those 
connections between... I shouldn't probably say, but this is my niece who had her own wall drawing done for her before she was even born. Um, yeah, no, I was She's just, kind of was living with my work from the beginning. <laughs> yeah, so I guess for me, I was just thinking about, you know, the body and, and vessels in your work and about how, um, yeah, I guess for me, thinking about um, fabrics and their, their relationship to the body and the way that they're... Um, a vessel in themselves, in a way. Well, um, and I so think for me that the, those were sort of interesting um, connections between this work and some of your previous work as well. Yeah, and kind of the body as a container, but also yeah. the wall as a container. Really, um, the first wall I ever did was in an old house that I uh, owned, or we renovated on Queen Queen West in 1979, and that. Those walls were really, really old with about 10 layers of paint wallpaper that, you know, we peeled back. But um, I just think, yeah, it's, you know, a wall. It seems so simple, but what what is the wall? And kind of, um, yeah, so basically just that trying to make this huge wall here, which is so heroic, to kind of have the person, in, you know, in my piece kind of engage with it without it being so vast and intimidating and sort of there's a connection, you know, so that they can enter the wall, like the way you enter a book. Thank you. Shayla, uh -huh. can you speak a little bit about the piece that you're planning on the facing wall for the, um, as a component of the next exhibition, The Unfinished yeah, Conversation? Yeah, it's, um, it's a really amazing show that Gaetan is curating with Mark Seeley, and um, without saying too much, it's, it's going to be um, quite quite simple or it's involving photographs I took in 1983 in what was then Zaire and now is the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. So it was um, this huge trip I took uh, where, you know, we camped every night or I mean it involved 23,000 kilometers traveling daily and Zaire was really hard to enter. Um, we almost couldn't enter it. Uh, it was under Mobutu, and um, so, yeah, 1983. And so uh, cameras were completely illegal. They actually still are in uh, the Congo. I was doing research recently, but I mean, it was very dangerous. And so I did take these pictures. Um, and they are of the architecture in Kisangani, which was Stanleyville. So the complex history of, um, from King Leopold all the way through, uh, the space just really spoke to me and it was this decaying Belgium colonial architecture which was falling apart. But I was drawn to kind of document that. But then, um, Gaetan and I were at an event and I met um, Raoul Peck, the, a hero, I mean the brilliant filmmaker, and we were talking because he on and off was living in Zaire for 24 years. So we were talking about Kisangani and he was just saying, well, I want to see those photographs. Or I mean basically because of the war since then, uh, the architecture appears, I mean he said it's completely gone, destroyed altered and when you when I went online to look there's very little left so it's a little hard for me to express sort of immediate but I'm just interested again in one time and space going into another and um, the sort of ghosting of this this material, these buildings, but also just their notion, you know, these notions of modernism and failed modernism and also this utopian um, sense the Belge had. And so, yeah, I don't want to say too much. The same way I didn't talk a lot about the wall, but this is a pretty amazing show that Gaetan's doing. So, uh, I, I, I'm, yeah, I'm going to be showing the photographs as like cinema stills. They'll be in a line, which is what I've done for years. So that it'll be quite simple just with those images as a document or people can look at. And 
you know, where I, there's some ideas I have for enlarging on that, but yeah, that's the idea I'm starting with now, yeah. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Shayla, for providing us with these special insights into the evolution of your wall drawing over its long history, as well as the political and ephemeral nature of your work. It was a real treat to see images of so many of your work that no longer exist. So thank you so much for sharing those with us. And thanks to our audience, again, for being here with us tonight. I'd like to invite you to join us again on December 11th, when Ann Pasternak, President and Artistic Director of Creative Time in New York will speak as part of our international lecture series. So hope to see you again then, and I hope you make it home safely tonight. Thank you for coming out. Thank you.